Hey fellow dividend investors, welcome back to another show of Sunday with European DJI. Can you imagine it's already episode number 7. Well, today I really would like to talk to you about what happened to at and and the dividend cut. I will keep that briefly because I already spent some time on it on my blog. I will refer later a little bit to it. But what I really would like to focus on today is like, what are we, what can we do with the loss of income that we had? So, because I'm a dividend growth investor, my main target is to grow my um, annual dividend income. And with this upcoming dividend cut from at and due to the merger with Discovery, um, well, effectively, I had to look into other dividend stocks. So today I will share with you five stocks, five high yield dividend stocks. Um, these are considerations. You will not get a full analysis uh, in here. And with that, I mean a full analysis. I mean the full valuation, but I will give you the highlights of those stocks and what I like about it. So um, yeah, stick with me today and um, enjoy the show. So in case you missed it, really quickly, AT&T by the CEO of John Stanky decided to spin off their um, Time Warner assets, which they just bought uh, a few years ago and, and merge it together with, uh, with Discovery. So you know this from Disco Discovery Channel and create a new company out of it. The idea here is that um, I said AT&T gets more flexibility to focus on its core business, which is wireless and 5G and uh, allow the new company to really um, be a competitor to Netflix and, and Disney when it comes to the streaming wars. With that, also AT&T is trying to deleverage their balance sheet um, so that they get more flexibility to focus on their wireless business, business. Hence, a lot of that will also be going to this new company that they're uh, seeing. Um, I find it a really awkward, um, how you say it, a really, really awkward um, thing they have done because what we need to remind and this is really what I don't like about um, uh, John Stanky just with the Q4 earnings he still mentioned we're committed to our dividends literally here if you go to the earnings trans transcript we're committed to sustaining our dividend at current levels and we'll give top priority to debt production at this time so just in, in, a, in a matter of weeks actually or, or, or a few months they have really changed the course and spinning it off. There are investors here, they're saying like, great, they should have done that. But I would like to highlight here actually um, uh, Dividend Swave tweet because he showed how John Stanky, uh, his path looked like, career looks like in AT&T. And as you can see, DirecTV was a major acquisition from uh, AT&T, which they sold for, what was it? Spun out, uh, sold for 16 billion. Uh, with lots of lots of goodwill depreciation or amortization. Then also they bought Time Warner, where he also had a really, really important role here because he, will he assumed lead of the Time Warner merger integration planning team. And was, uh, I said, the CEO of AT&T's media business before he became CEO of AT&T. So what we can only say is like he was part of this whole journey of two really big field acquisitions up till now and now he's spinning it off. It's insane. It's insane. You could say lessons learned. Okay, lessons learned. He, he comes to this conclusion, but then he's really still in denial because what he's talking about is about creating shareholder value and such. If you go back to the notes of 2016 when the AT&T Time Warner acquisition was announced, it was also like unmet, uh, I said we, we will create unmet value because of the AT&T wireless business. You know, we have a direct interaction with the consumer. Combining that with Time Warner's assets, we will really unlock a lot of value. And now already they're spinning it off. What I, what I honestly feel like few years ago they were looking at their uh, at their wireless business seeing it as a utility um, management uh, was trying I don't know trying to build their ego had needed a lot of acquisitions bought some businesses like direct TV that was already dying streaming was already there they could have seen it already with Netflix and such they thought like, okay let's compete with Netflix let's have the Time Warner assets heavily over Price paid for it because it was, I think, 85 billion acquisition plus debt, 107 billion. Now they're spinning it off for 43 billion. Tell me where the 60 billion going to? I don't know. They're really not clear into this in the press release because you can see it here. Some debts goes with it, but I don't know how much. So 
um, um, 43 billion of debt plus Warner Media. So this is just like, still, I mean, like I'm missing like 25 billion debt here. That's what I effectively missing uh, based on what they acquired in 2018. But if you go to the, um, I say to the, the fine print in the press release, you will also see that they will need to amort amortize 4 billion plus 2 billion every, I don't know, every year uh, upcoming or every quarter upcoming. So there are still a lot of write-offs to come there at, on the AT&T side of this, um, uh, of this balance sheet. So for me, it just shows that um, I'm really disappointed in Stanky. He really, really is, has been lying to us effectively. Also, the dividend cut, I think it is written somewhere in the on the last pages, also of the press release. So um, this is really something that um, I, I don't understand. Yeah, so they're, they're talking thing here about attractive dividend targeting, dividend payout ratio of 40, 43% of 20 billion. So this kind of 8 billion, they were paying 15 billion debt before. Hence, our dividends are going in half. And you know what's the worst? Because of their commitment earlier to the dividend, what's the worst is many people, widows, uh, retired people, were, were having the stock on this promise that their dividend is uh, safe. And if a CEO is then reiterating that, that they are committed to the dividend, they have just been fooling us up till two, three months from now. This is really what I don't like about the CEO. They should understand the shareholder base. They should understand that investors are mainly in it for the dividend here. They could, should have communicated better and not fool us as investors. This is also why I sold my shares. So I wrote an article about it. If you want to know more about it, um, uh, you can read it here about the main three reasons. But you can hear already from my um, tone of voice that I'm really not liking what I'm seeing. The good thing is, you know, there's all, uh, prices what you pay, values what you got. I bought AT&T last year at $29 per share, approximately. I sold them this week at $32 per share. So I made a small profit on it. And this is a lesson want, what I wanted to share with you as well. Um, it does happen more often in my portfolio that a company decides to do a dividend cut. And I think it happens to all of us. We cannot predict the future. Sometimes things turn bad. This happens. What I did learn over the year, that's really important to use a value, uh, I said to use a margin of safety when buying companies. And here I would like to say like to what Buffett learned from Charlie Munger. Um, it's not only about um, buying cheap companies, let's say, um, or buying fair companies at a cheap price. It's also about paying a fair price for high quality companies. For me, AT&T has never been a high quality company. This is the reason why I always was looking for a margin of safety at AT&T. When it hit around $29, I felt like, well, you know, this, this uh, company deserves to, based on just um, a discounted cash flow analysis and everything, this company um, deserves to trade around $35. Yeah, so $29, I felt like that's a 20% discount. This is the reason, in my opinion, well, well, after this news, um, I was still able to lock in a profit. And I've done this before because when dividend uh, was cut for Disney, uh, and that was around first week of May, I believe, last year during the pandemic 2020, uh, um, I straight away sold the company. I sold it for like, I don't know, $100, something like that at that time. But also my acquisition costs were on average around hundred dollars because I was also using a valuation, uh, a fair value principle there for Disney. Um, now the good thing is about that I also hadn't got capital loss there. And one of the things also as a dividend investor, I don't I want to preserve my capital or my principal. So the money that I invested in it, I want to get out of it even if things go bad. So what I've done at the time, I've sold Disney straight away after that because I saw only the parks being closed. I saw a lot of capital investments coming up for the streaming wars with Disney Plus. I had no doubt that they will do well with Disney Plus, but I didn't expect a dividend in the upcoming years. And so far, uh, we are one year later. They are looking at the dividend again, but you know, debt. Uh, I said they need to spend a lot on their their Disney Plus or going debt. So it's just not a company for me right now as a dividend investor. I can come back later when they've got their act together again with Disney Plus, but for now I'm staying away. 
But at that time, Chubb, um, an insurance company based in Switzerland nowadays, was also trading for around 100, per, uh, 100 uh, US dollars with a 3% dividend yield. What I wanted to show you here, because some people say, like, how could you sell Disney? Because people look at Disney then at the price where it's trading now from a growth point of view. But remember, I'm a dividend investor. But if we then look at Chubb versus um, Disney and my investment decision that I made at the time, it's almost a similar performance. So a boring insurance company like Chubb has, uh, has had a similar track record over the year. And we are talking about a year later now as Disney. The only difference with it is that for me, Chubb has a much nicer uh, balance sheet at the moment because they, they don't have something like a streaming wars going on. They have been growing their dividend again with two or three percent. So I'm still like on a yield of cost of three comma three percent or something like that uh, for, for this company. So. I've, I've actually increased my dividend income at the time. And this is how I'm looking now today at AT&T as well. I cannot compare AT&T to Disney from a quality point of view, but at both, uh, at both times I bought the company at, um, I would say with a margin of safety. Hence, I got my money back out of the company. I can redeploy it. So what shall we redeploy it then? Um, uh, the, the proceeds I got from at and So today I want to share with you five companies that I'm looking at. The tickers are OHI, so this Omega, Omega Healthcare Investors. I will share with you Enegas, Chesnara, Nationale Niederlande, and British American Tobacco. What I will do now, I will show really briefly, quickly what the company is about and then through some of the um, uh, I said, metrics that I look at when screening from a dividend safety point of view and, and their major, major risk that I also see at this company because I think it's always good to mention the, mention the risk associated to an investment as well. And you know, these are high yielding companies. So from that point of view, there's, you need to understand what you're investing in as well. So for people that know, know uh, Omega Healthcare uh, investment, it's an investment, um, it's, it's, it's a real, real estate investment trust, uh, which is investing in facilities for senior care. Um, senior care here, I would say <laughs> effectively, it's usually the last place where, where seniors go to, um, let's say the elderly uh, before they die effectively. So um, Omega Healthcare Investor has, has been around already for quite some time. I like the company. I'm owning this company already for three, four years. But you need to know it, ha it had a really hard time during COVID-19. And one of the things we need to be aware of, therefore, is also that rent collection is not easy. In their first quarter earnings for 2021, they were also mentioning this, that overall um, they are able to get, a, uh, how is it? They collect, I think, around 99% of the uh, uh, the rents they need, but what is really important, um, although it's it's going pretty well, um, the occupancy is still below pre-COVID-19 levels as such, but many operators continue to be reliant on governmental financial re support. So this is one of the biggest risks that if the government stops their support to those facilities, it will impact Omega Healthcare investors. So please be aware of that. Um, this is something you need to track uh, closely in the news. If there's just one thing you want to keep an eye on, on Omega Healthcare Investors. So if we then look into the metrics from Omega Healthcare Investors, so they are trading currently around $36. They have a dividend history of around 18 years of growing dividends uh, with annual dividend of around uh, 268. The, this gives us the dividend yield of around 7.5% with a dividend, five year dividend growth 4%. What's good to know is that lately in the last two, three years, they've been hardly growing the dividends. So it's probably more like one or 2%. So keep that in mind. Um, don't expect a lot of dividend growth in the upcoming, I would say quarters or maybe even year. The dividend uh, revenue has been growing properly with 3.71%, uh, but their free cash flow growth has been quite mediocre from an FFO point of view as well. Uh, what's good to know is that during this uh, pandemic, they have been ac acquiring few assets again, which I think is um, good to do it at the depth of a crisis, usually get them much more cheaper. However, when we look at it from a debt point of view, I would like to see um, actually that they have to pay less interest um, and therefore they need to 
manage the depth really well because it get it's really getting stretched stretched here so this for me something like a warning sign as well like um, you know already that um, they are supported by financial gov uh, by governance uh, financially plus they have a lot of depth on their balance sheet so these are two two things that you really need to watch out for although their dividend is nicely covered from an uh, funds from operations point of view um i find the company not cheap i would say even probably slightly overvalued from what you may expect from omega healthcare i would personally uh, prefer it in the low 30s if i wanted to add more uh, as i mentioned i i own few shares already for now i don't intend to um, acquire more but i think if you're interested in replacing at&t with a high dividend yield stock then this might be a consideration for you Okay, the next stock that I would like to uh, share with you is Anagas. What's probably good to know for you is that um, I wrote, a, uh, I created a video about this already. Um, you can find the link on my blog or I will put also a link in the description to the video directly on YouTube. So I did a full analysis on this company um, uh, earlier this year. Not a lot has changed. So I think if you look at it, you will still find the general narrative here. But if you're not familiar with Anagas, Anagas is effectively a, um, a TSO, a utility. Uh, you can say it, that's playing in the gas industry here. And it's really big also in liquid natural gas. So um, if you think about what's happening in the oil industry, oil, uh, we know it's really bad branded. Um, gas is seen as a transitionary um, energy. And this is what Anagas is playing on as well. It's also part of their strategies to transform into more clean energy. So what is important here to know from a company is that they have a strategy to keep increasing their dividends over the next five years. They just recently increased the dividends with 5% again. However, you need to know that, um, uh, how is it? By 2026, the dividend growth will be just 1%. And I think I found it here in one of their uh, latest strategic updates. So here they say, yeah, here's what they said. So they just increased their dividend by 5% 2020, but then they will increase it 1% per year over the next three years and then maintain the, uh, the dividend by 1 euro 74. So what it means here with Anagas, don't expect a lot of dividend growth. Um, I find this company quite reliable from that point of view. So I think this dividend is of course never 100% safe, but I think over the next or five years you can expect uh, on, on collecting these dividends. Uh, when you buy dividends from Spain, I believe it's a 19% uh, tax rate. So it's not much higher than the 15% we pay on American uh, shares. Important to remember that the dividend therefore will hardly grow. If we then go back to our metrics, so it trades currently for around 19 euro and I guess sometimes you can get a little bit cheaper as well. Um, based on tra how it's trading. It has a dividend history of 20 years of dividend growth at the moment. I think it might actually uh, replace one of the uh, stocks in the European Dividend Noble 30 list that I have with the companies that cut their dividend um, uh, in the last year. So stay tuned for that one. Currently, it's almost yielding 9%, which is really high and ha has a had a dividend growth of around 5%. So like I mentioned before, don't expect the same going forward, rather a flat dividend or 1% growth over time. What's important here to note is that they pay an interim dividend and a final dividend. I believe the interim dividend is in the end of the year, around December, and the final dividend somewhere in the summer, around June, July. Um, Five-year revenue growth was declining. Uh, funds from over operations have been slightly declining over the last five years. You need to know 2020 was a special year. So you will see with some more stocks that it was impacted in 2020. So it's not always good to only look at historical values. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense for Enegas to look at uh, earnings per share here because of it's more like you can more you need to more evaluate it from funds from operations point of view and it has a really healthy dividend payout here with around 61 percent um, depth is on the high end for, in my opinion but they can easily cover it and because of having such a high depth that also creates this inflexibility and uh, the uncertainty with the energy sector also therefore um, is therefore for me no surprise that the dividend that the dividends are uh, growing not so much over the upcoming few years. They really need to keep it in balance. From a multiple point of view, I think it's fairly valued here. So um, what is just important really to know from a risk 
point of view is that there's always regulatory risk here with the Spanish government at the at at the moment. So keep an eye on that. Uh, we've seen it also with Red Electrica. Um, where the dividend hasn't been safe from that point of view. And the question is, can it really transition as a company into the more new energy sources? So having said that, um, invest with caution on Enegas, but um, I find the dividend yield in relation to the risk, I find it a good risk and, and reward. Okay, the next company is Jasnara. It's a uh, life insurance uh, company, if I could say it like that. It's a uh, small cap. I discussed it on one of the podcasts when we were talking about small cap um, uh, companies. And I will actually share now a little bit about their company because um, what I like about it, if you think about realty income, Jasnara has a similar philosophy. It's the dividend first. They, they, they effectively almost say like, we are here to create to 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 provide an attractive dividend to our shareholders as, as because this is the first thing they mention in their investment pro proposition if you go to, to the website straight away um they, they mention about their dividend before they start talking about anything else um which is for me really clear they want to uh, also uh, continue growing their dividend and they do this mainly via acquisitions at the moment so if you think about it it was um, a small divesture back in 2004 uh, from a life insurance business so a small spin-off just just now started to live on itself and since then they have been mainly uh, growing by acquisitions from companies, from mainly the larger companies that were divi divesting their assets as well. Because, for instance, they were not interesting enough for them in the larger and the greater scheme of things. But for a small company, a small cap like Jasnara, that's usually uh, very interesting because they can purchase those small companies, usually a bit undervalued or with a margin of safety, so that the earnings that they can get from that uh, portfolio are straight away uh, adding to the bottom line of just narrow and, that, and that's what is really nice for such a small company that's growing via investments and as you can see um, they also uh, for instance just recently in 2020 uh, bought 44,000 policies policies from Argenta Bank um, just one example of one of the latest acquisitions they also put it in the strategy so they are continually assessing opportunities for growth through through acquisitions they show here also how they are doing that so if you're interested in it go to the go to the investor website and check it out um, if you then look at it from a dividend point of view they pay an annual dividend and an interim dividend so again biannually uh, as such and they have been um, growing their dividends since 2007 effectively when they really started to pay the uh, dividends okay so let's look a little bit into their um, uh, metrics here so currently it trades for uh, 279 pence you need to think about it in, in, in England it's always around pence not around pounds uh, important to remember so it's also um, um, if you think about uh, it's two pounds 79 here so it's not um, I said it might be interesting sometimes for penny stock investors, but uh, I don't see that really happening here with Chesnar. It's, it's more, merely unknown as a company. Dividend history of 14 years of increasing dividends, uh, currently spotting a 7.7% yield with a dividend growth of 2.4 um, over the last five years. Their revenue growth has been 16%, mainly due to acquisitions, but their EPS growth uh, was declining with 15%. What you need to know here is that this this figure is, is um, non-representative because they had quite some impact during COVID-19 with uh, insurance policies and such. Um, that's why the earnings per share in 2020 were so low. I see it rather as a one-off. So if you would take that out, probably the EPS growth will be positive when you look at it. Uh, from 2021 point of view couldn't calculate the cash free cash flow um, because it was negative five years ago hence why this number is not representing here but let's go to the dividends itself um, and, and the payout ratio so if you look at the current free cash flow their dividend payout is around 62 percent i mentioned already about the 2020 eps of i think it was um, uh, 14 pence Hence, um, there was a large payout uh, um, ratio, but I see it really as a one-off and it reflects also in the free cash flow. Um, I find the debt and the equity um, of 11%, I find it really good. So they have effectively a really clean balance sheet. 
and the interest coverage as well they can easily pay off the interest that they have due on their debt valuation wise eight you get it for an eight times um, uh, multiple on the free cash flow and the 20 times on the earnings and remember really low earnings in 2020 so i believe if they go back to normal it will be again around the 10 pe so the risk here with this company it's a small cap really not well known so this is something you really need to take into consideration uh, do you feel comfortable investing with small caps i can tell you already what uh, uh, at least half of the proceeds of at&t i will invest on monday in just nara so just uh, just to be having a full disclosure here i like the company enough i don't really have small companies in my portfolio so expect me to to buy some uh, in the upcoming week um then the fourth company that i would like to talk about is nationale nederlande i expect particularly the dutch investors here that are following me on youtube uh, to know this company if you don't know it nationale nederlande is i mean it's really known for their uh, insurance policies uh, it's big over here in poland if i drive into warsaw from the site where i'm living uh, straight away you see a big sign of nationale nederlande on the building they're actually quite quite uh, visible in eastern europe but they're also in other uh, um, quite attractive and, and visible in other uh, countries in actually in the whole world so it's a global company and it's a spin-off of ing bank from several years ago really great because in my opinion national and elon is a really good insurance company i touched a bit also on it in um, in an earlier video at the start of this year where i was uh, sharing few stocks of an undervalued sector. I will also link it in the description this video so you can hear me talking a little bit more about it. What I like and what I always look for in European companies is their dividend policy. So like Chesnara that is focused on dividends straight away. Um, and then group here intends to pay a progressive ordinary per share. So they, they are quite outspoken about it. But what you need to know, last year they were not able to pay their dividends. Um, um i said in 2020 due to regulatory restrictions on the dividend payments this is important to know um due to restrictions in the dividend payments that uh, the central bank and such um, uh, put on bank financial institutions however um they have restored that dividend because uh, what they did with the interim dividend in 20 uh, i said in 2020 they also took in into consideration here the final dividend of 1.4 euro that they wanted to pay in um, um, as a final dividend over 2019 so they've included that here um, now with this so don't be misled if you start now um, looking at the dividend yield because the dividend yield might show you that it's a little bit higher than uh, it should be they explain it here i believe where is it the real dividend um, per share is 2.33 when you look at it on an annualized basis and if you look at it also from an interim dividend point of view so it's a bit confusing if you just look look at the statistics on uh, for instance uh, yahoo finance or something like that don't be misled by that because i think it gives you a really high dividend which is not um, uh, correct so um, what is also good to know is that their free cash flow, if you look into it, it looks like the company had a really, really large cash flow. But what I wanted to highlight to you is it has really to do with their working capital that has been changing and, and the loans. So if you look at it here, they um, uh, had quite some changes in their loans of, of one and a half um, billion almost and also in financial liabilities. So because of, um, uh, how is it? them playing a little bit with their uh, with these figures let's say they were able to boost up their cash flow don't be misled by that because it looks like they had a brilliant year no it isn't like that it was really around debt management why their uh, cash flow was boosting uh, as a one-off so keep that in consideration if you're looking at the metrics from um, national and nederlande Okay, quickly then, the company is currently yielding around 5.5%. It's a little bit less than AT&T was yielding for us, of course. Dividend growth, by, uh, by the way, is uh, almost 9%, which is really great. Biannual um, dividend payouts, uh, as I mentioned to you before. But what I really like now here is that almost everything is on green. Revenue growth of 7% over the last five years. EPS growth of 5% uh, over the last five years couldn't calculate the free cash flow because they had few negative years of free cash flow due to, um, uh, I said, uh, working capital. Uh, I said, 
uh, management and, and 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 some other related stuff but you really need to look into their balance sheet uh, into their cash flow straight statement because as an insurance companies they have a lot of one-offs so it's not a reliable um, measure for me here eps payout 40 percent so dividend is quite safe from that point of view debt to equity really low interest really nicely covered so from that point of view um, i find that national and nederland has a really safe dividend so i expect the dividend still to grow in the upcoming years i just actually reject uh, regret that i didn't buy more shares of this company uh, at the depth at the depth of the crisis last year because it was trading around well it was low 20s or something like that share price doubled already to 44. Um, with a pe of seven and a half um, i think this company is attractively uh, valued just know it's a financial institution uh, regulated by the central um, ECB, let's say European Central Bank. So in times of crisis, you cannot count on getting a dividend payment. That's really important to know if you invest in financial institutions in Europe, you cannot count during a crisis on, on their dividends. And this is something you need to consider as a dividend investor. Do you feel, um, com uh, feel, do you feel comfortable owning stocks? during a crisis when you're retired and living off the dividend income that they might be cut that's a consideration that's personal that you need to make yourself but i just wanted to share that with you okay let's go to the fifth one again a european one and this british american tobacco i hope you're still with me here try to uh, quickly uh, uh, progress on this one and then round it up but i really wanted to give you enough alternatives um, uh, to choose from from effectively so who doesn't know British American tobacco? I assume almost everyone. I wrote an article about this also um, last year. Um, I'm quite bullish on the company. So if you go through this article, you will see why. I think um, it's a company that's really doing well. It's really trying to invest in these new categories. Uh, of course, their existing um, cigarettes business is slightly declining over the years, but it's, it's being well compensated with the vapors and tobacco heatings and the other oral products that they're, um, uh, I said, selling. Um, what you also need to know is that their strategy, and I almost start to believe it, building a better tomorrow, but they're at least they're really trying to, um, how you say it, um, and this is what I really like about to encourage smokers to switch completely to scientifically substantiated reduced risk alternatives. So they see they are investing a lot in R&D to um, reduce the health impact that that smoking brings. Um, you know, if you're in the business of um, how you say it of smoking in general, you know that you're a sin stock. So any attempt to make it um, healthier, I think, is a good thing. Um, if you're really against cigarettes, you'll probably say they shouldn't even exist. I would agree with you as well if you say that. But if you have nothing against sin stocks, then British American Tobacco, I think, is an interesting company to consider. Now, to show you what I like about it, um, 21 years of uh, dividend history. It's also a European um, dividend aristocrat and part of the Noble 30 members on my uh, blog. A dividend yield currently around 7.7%. Dividend have been growing nicely with 6.5%. Uh, so if I think about my uh, dividend income goals, I want to see a dividend yield of minimum 3% or 2.75% and growing by 6% um, uh, growth per year. Uh, British American Tobacco is so far um, uh, checking the boxes there. Now, if you then look from a revenue growth point of view, almost 15% over the last five years, but you need to know that there's acquisition related uh, revenue in there. So hence, if you look at it from an EPS point of view, it has been around 4%. Now, um, dividend is here not outpacing the growth as such from that point of view, because their uh, free cash flow has been growing also with more than double digits over the last five years. EPS payout 78%. It's a company that pays a high yield um, on purpose because there's not much more to do from this company. So it's investing in, in, the, in, in better health products, let's say, in what they're doing, but they don't need so much money from it from that point of view. That's why they can also afford to pay a high um, uh, payout on, on, on based on their earnings and their dividends. Um, from a cash flow point of view, it looks even better, 55%, easily below 60%, which is typically a mark for me. 
uh, debt to equity is really healthy also with 64% and they can easily also cover their debt. So from that point of view, the valuation multiples are really low in my opinion. But this is what you see with most of the tobacco stocks. They are not part, uh, they are usually excluded in many index funds and trackers because of uh, ESG um, um, compliance. So many pension funds and such are currently only investing in ESG compliant uh, indexes. And that's why companies like um, Altria, Philip Morris and British American Tobacco are not any part of that. My personal opinion is that that is a bit hypocrite because if you look at the companies that they are including like Volkswagen, we know what they did with Dieselgate, uh, banks that have fine after another for cheating on their customers. So, but hey, that's that's my opinion on that. Hence, I don't think there exists something like um, companies that don't have and that don't do anything wrong as such uh, to society. Um, because I don't know really where the, the, the fine line is uh, and that's why it's really personal. Anyway, having said that, I find British American Tobacco probably the most attractive company out of this list to consider. And um, yeah, um, this is it from my side, I would say then. So what I've done today, is I've shared five companies with you. I started from least attractive to the most attractive, in my humble opinion. These, this is not investment advice. I'm just trying to inspire here you um, you here. I haven't done my um, full analysis on these companies as per today. You didn't see a, a valuation from from me here in the in, in the sense of discounted cash flow, EBITDA multiple. So you still need to do a bit of your homework. But um, yeah, from my point of view, I'm definitely going to invest in Chasnara. And a second consideration for me is to maybe pull the trigger this week on Nationale Nederlande. Having said all of this, I really hope that you enjoyed today's Sunday with European DGI. Let me know um, if you have anything to add to these tickers, to these five stocks, or let me know in the comments what other stocks you're considering to replace your AT&T with, or maybe even share with me why you're keeping AT&T. Anyway, if you want to see more of these kinds of videos, just hit the subscribe button, but don't forget to hit the notification bell. Then next Sunday, you will automatically get notified with the next video um, that I will be publishing. So from now, enjoy the remainder of the weekend. Have a great week. Should be good weather here over in most of Europe. So enjoy it. Have a good day. Cheers.